Shall we open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 19. This morning, we having finished John's prologue last week, we start his story. A couple of, well, it's been a month or two ago, we, we looked at a couple of weeks out of Luke chapter 7 at John's doubt, John the Baptist. He had heard from his own disciples that 150 miles to the north, Jesus was doing great things. And John was waiting for the Messiah to come and deliver him from prison and to take the Romans out of the equations as far as the Jews were concerned. And, and he had doubts, honest ones. And Jesus answered them. And said of him there in Luke chapter 7, of those born among women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. And we talked about whether we would have picked John as the greatest prophet. And we agreed, I think, for the most part, no, we'd pick a lot of other people. Not sure we'd pick John. But we realized that John's greatness was not his holiness or his spiritual commitment, though both were found in him, but he was great for a couple of reasons. His proximity to Jesus, he was the last Old Testament prophet, and the message that then he was able to deliver. All of the other prophets said, well, he's coming, and John said, he's right there which made him great. So, we looked at his life and his ministry. We're going to see a little bit more of him this morning. But the Lord said he was great. You know, there are some people that are only great in their own eyes. And there are others that people just call great, whether they're great or not. Herod was called Herod the Great. Alexander was called Alexander the Great. By definition, great means exceptional, right? A rarity. Extraordinary. I, I heard of a fellow that went to the psychiatrist and said, hey, you got to help me. I have an inferiority complex. He said, I'll run some tests. And he did, and he came back. He said, the tests are in. You don't have a complex at all. You really are inferior. <laughs> <laughs> Has nothing to do with the bio study. I just like the jokes. So I threw it in there. No, I, I can work anything in for a minute. Well, this morning we want to take a look at what else makes John the Baptist great. And John begins with that in his story. And that is, John, we want to know who John is, his view of himself, and then his view of Jesus. Because who you are and what you do define who you are. And that's his focus this morning. Who is he and what did he do? Because, you know, the early church had great success sharing the gospel because they believed in the gospel and... They were passionate about it. If I asked you this morning, and, and we'll start and end with the same premise, when was the last time you spoke to someone about Christ? When was the last time you witnessed verbally, not just, I'm going to be a good witness, no, spoke up, and actually articulated what you believed? When was the last time you were able to pray with someone and actually lead them to Christ? Has it been a week or a month or a year? Or have you ever done just that? Who you are and what you do defines what you'll be in God's plans. So we want to look at two things about John the Baptist this morning. His identity and his activity. Verse 19. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem. And they asked him, who are you? And then down in verse 24 we read, now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. <clears throat> John the Baptist's ministry around the Jordan went on for about a year, people confessing their sins, their need for a Savior being made clear, and the ministry of John grew like few had in the years that had passed. And Jerusalem, the religious capital and their leadership, took note. They sent some priests and Levites from Jerusalem, from the Pharisees, and they arrived in this large crowd, and they were sent by the Jews, and their question to John was, who do you think you are? And where do you get off doing what you're doing? John was popular. Thousands thronged to him in the middle of nowhere. He was, he was a guy that God greatly anointed. He only had one message. Repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. And, and yet, God was moving. There had not been this kind of enthusiasm over spiritual things in generations. No one remembered when it had been like this. And they noticed in this delegation, they come with some questions because they viewed John 
as someone that worked outside the system. He was an, an upstart. He had no schooling. He had no degree. He was a renegade. And this, this religious establishment, this community, was managed by the Sanhedrin, 70 men who were responsible for both the, the, the belief system and the practices of all of the Jews. So that would be bad enough, but then half of them, Paul will tell us later, were Sadducees. They didn't even believe in life after death or that God existed. And they were on the religious committee. They were sad, you see. That's the way you remember it. If you've got no hope for the future, you're sad, you see. Well, these folks came from the Pharisee side of things. And John, in his gospel, uses the term, and I want you to notice it in verse 19, the Jews. Because John doesn't use it like the other fellows. He uses it 70 different times in his gospel, more than all of the other gospel writers combined. Because by the end of the first century, the reference to the Jews was more than just a comment racially or to a people group or to a nation. It was almost exclusively a reference to the religious leadership in Jerusalem or those outside of Jerusalem once Jerusalem fell. But their issues and their, and their desire and their understanding was that they wanted to oppose Christianity in general and Christ in particular. So when you hear John saying the Jews, you want to understand that he's speaking about the religious leaders who were just absolute enemies, hostile enemies of the cross. In fact, everyone that came to John's baptism were Jews. <laughs> so those, that's no distinction at all. But, but John is focusing on those who would oppose the gospel. And so when he says in verse 19, the Jews sent some priests, it was the enemies of the gospel, certainly the enemies of the cross. And they sent priests and Levites, which is interesting because John was a Levite, and he was a priest. So John the Baptist came from a, a family of Levites. His father, you remember, was a priest, Zachariah. So John the Baptist was a PK. He was a priest kid, or a pastor's kid, if you want. And John was different, though. He had left Jerusalem in that system of, of, of being moved up in your priestly work, and he had gone to the desert, and he was kind of a you know, a one-of-a-kind guy, and thousands of folks had followed him. But the weird thing is, priests, by definition, never preached. They, they helped in rituals, they aided in sacrifice. It wasn't really their job to preach. And yet John was preaching. And so these priests and these Levites from Jerusalem, the opposition come and they say, who do you think you are? What are you doing? Well, John answers, and he begins by answering by telling them who he is not. He says in verse 20, he confessed, he did not deny, he confessed, I am not the Mashiach, the Christ, the anointed one. Not that guy. Twice he uses the word confessed. Once you read the little term, he didn't deny, which means he left no room for doubt. He made it clear, I am not the Messiah. Whatever you think of me, and the hopes were certainly that the Messiah was coming, that's not me. And then they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Now, we went over that a few weeks ago, right? That there were these two comings of Jesus, and that John would be the forerunner, John the Baptist, before the first coming of Christ, like Elijah will be, according to Malachi 4, 5, and the second. And, and I think we went over several of those scriptures where, where Jesus said in Matthew 11 to the disciples, if you can receive it, this is Elijah. Not in the sense that he's the same person, but he had the same ministry. He, he paved the way for the coming of the Lord. And when Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples, thinking about it, having just seen Elijah, <laughs> said to the Lord, well, why do the scribes tell us that Elijah must first come? And, and Jesus said, Elijah must indeed come first and restore all things. But let me just say to this, this to you, Elijah has come already, and they've done to him whatever they've wanted. So likewise, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. So he makes that distinction, if you will. And even uh, Luke tells us that when Zacharias, John's dad, gets that visit from the angel, he is told that he is going to go before the Lord in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. So they thought, well, all right, if you're not the Messiah, are you the forerunner? Because they didn't see these two comings. Are you then Elijah? And he simply said, not. And they said, well, are you then the prophet? Now, one of the common hopes in, the, in, in that day and for centuries that had followed, you know, was, was a, a hope that was attached to a, a sentence that Moses had presented to the people back in Deuteronomy 18, 15. And he had said to the people there, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me, and when he comes you will fear him. 
And so they were hoping that would be a man like Moses who would deliver them out of bondage and would be a, a dynamic kind of empowered leader. And again, John the Baptist said, no. With every question, his answers got shorter. I am not the Christ. I am not, no. Right? It, it is possible from verse 26, and, and I'll point it out to you now, we'll look at it in a minute, that standing in the crowds this day was Jesus himself. That he was there in the crowd. You, you remember that in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus had been baptized. John had recognized Jesus by the signs that the Father who sent him had told him about. And then Jesus had gone for 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness to be tempted to the devil. That day, though, he came back. In fact, the very next day, and we're going to see it in verse 29, the next day, Jesus will make himself known. So it could very well be that in this conversation, Jesus was already standing in the crowds. In fact, I'll tell you something that John does, and you can watch for it. For the next seven days, John will tell us what happens every day. And he'll use the term the next day a lot, verse 29, the next day, verse 35, the next day. So we're going to get a look at the first week of Jesus' ministry. John's very interested that we grab hold of, of what took place as the Lord began his public ministry. But in any event, as John is answering these questions, it is quite likely that the Lord is smiling at the exchange between John and these Levites and priests from Jerusalem. Um, and John's aware of it. In fact, John will say so there uh, in a few verses in verse 26. There's one standing among you, you don't know him. Well, then they said in verse 22, well, then who are you? That's all the ones we thought you might be. Who are you that we can give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And John said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the path of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah had said. Now, I want you to notice what John says of himself. I am a voice. He's the word. I am here to declare the word. I, all I can do is speak out. I can be a voice, but the word is Jesus. And he that is coming is the Lord. I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Look, I'm a road worker. I'm pouring cement so that you know how to get right with God and what path to travel. Now, John the Baptist might very well have answered this question differently. Let's say he was a little full of himself, like most of us are. He might have said this, I am the son of the great priest, Zechariah, who received a visit from the angel before I was even conceived and told what my name would be. I'm that fellow that, that, that Isaiah wrote about 700 years ago. I'm that fellow that Malachi, 400 years ago, thought he better put in his little book as well. I'm that guy. The Messiah, when he comes, will tell you, I am the greatest prophet that ever lived. That's me. Herod often came to see me, wanted to know about eternal life. I was filled with the Spirit from my mother's womb. I've had a Nazarite vow of dedication since the day that I was born. Might have said all that stuff. Instead, he says this, I'm a voice working on the road, telling you about the one that's coming. And I thought to myself, how much more do you think the church could accomplish for the glory of God if we didn't make our ministries all about us? Buy my CD, get my book, come to my show, watch my program, get on my mailing list. What if we were just voices that went, it's all about Jesus? And John is certainly like that. I, I remember reading years ago about Toscanini, who was a famous uh, symphony director in Italy, doing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and, and, and the people were just hungry to hear it. This guy, there was no one better. And so when he finished the symphony, the, the place went berserk. They cheered for minutes on end for him and for his symphony. But one of, his, uh, one of the folks in the symphony years later wrote about that day that during the cheering, Toscanini leaned forward into the pit and said, look, I am nothing and you are nothing. Beethoven is everything. That was where his commitment lie. I, I suggest that, that you and me ought to be saying the same thing, except change that word Beethoven to Jesus. We're nothing. He's uh, everything. Who are you? Are you the Messiah? Are you the Elijah? Are you the prophet? No, no, I'm just, I'm just out here talking about the word. The word that is coming. How beautiful is that? You know, when uh, Aaron's sons tried to light strange fire on the day that the Lord came to light the offering there in Leviticus chapter 10, the Lord slew both of his children. 
they had come out to draw attention to themselves. And, and what the Lord said, although it was presented to them in a very difficult time to Aaron, the Lord said this to Aaron. It's well worth learning the verse. Verse 3. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, the Lord says, and before all of the people, I must be glorified. Two prerequisites for serving the Lord. Number one, when you go to the Lord, you better consider who he is. He's holy. And when you stand before others, you better consider that he wants all the credit. If you'll do that, you'll be fine. Those boys did absolutely the opposite. So John the Baptist comes upon the scene, miraculously born to two older parents, Zachariah and Elizabeth, who was a cousin to Mary who was going to bear Jesus. In fact, according to Luke 1, and you might want to read Luke 1 in terms of these verses, John the Baptist was still in his mother's womb when Mary became pregnant, and when she met with Elizabeth, John the Baptist leapt in Elizabeth's womb. He responded to the yet-to-be-born child. Eventually, John is born, and at the circumcision, they asked what his name should be, and his mother says, John, and they said, well, no one in your family's named John. And they looked to his father, Zacharias, who had been kept from speaking for nine months because he had kind of wrestled with the angel's promise there in the temple. And he wrote down, his name shall be called John. And then he was able to speak, and he began to praise the Lord. And you can read in Luke 1 the prophecy of his father over this young man's life to come. As John the Baptist grew up, though, he became a pretty eccentric kid, didn't he? He started to wear camel's hair. You know, he wanted to look like a prophet. He started dressing up weird. No parents ever had to face that before, have they? <laughs> he started to live in the desert. He started to eat weird foods. I'm sure that mom and dad sat around and shook their heads and went, he'll probably outgrow it. I hope he outgrows it. But he was unlike his priestly father. He came from the desert to prominence, and God gave him a voice. And he, he did live that Nazarite vow. It's a dedication vow that you read about in in numbers, where you, you don't cut your hair, you don't get near any dead things, you don't have any fruit of the vine, wine or grapes or raisins. You have this strict um, separation life. It's, it's an uncontaminated life that, from which you minister. And John walked that out. That's who John was. Or who are you, John? I'm just a voice. He knew who he was not. He knew who he was. Secondly, his activity, beginning here in verse 24. Those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked them, they said, well, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Now, notice that this group immediately then challenges John's activity. It's almost like a, a clashing of the swords, because, you know, if you're not the Messiah, if you're not some famous prophet or that prophet that Moses told us about, that you might have had authority by being one of those, what are you doing out here? Who commissioned you? Who sent you? You see, to them, it's all a matter of authority. It's all about the rules, man. Who do you think you are? According to their worldly standards, and, and, and still to this day, those who wield the most power determine what the truth is for people and proclaim it as such. And to, John, to them, John the Baptist had become more than an irritant because the people were thronging to John. The crowds were huge. Jesus huge, uh, used sorry, the, the, the popularity of John there in Luke 20 to argue with the Pharisees and say, look, if you'll tell me whether John's baptism was really a God thing or a man thing, I'll be able to answer your questions. And they realized they couldn't take either side. If, I, if we say God thing, the people will love us, and Jesus will ask us why we weren't baptized by him. If we say a man thing, the people will turn on us. And they said, oh, we don't know. And the Lord said, yeah, and I'm not telling you anything else. But that's how popular John was. The Pharisees, these verse 24 folks who sent these priests, were all about rules and regulations and rights. And in their eyes, John the Baptist had no credentials. He had no proper procedural authority or power or position. You know, one of the problems was, and I think we shared it with you before, was that baptism up to this point had only been practiced for Gentiles. The Jews were never baptized because they saw themselves as, hey, we're God's chosen people. So when you were a Gentile and you went from polytheism, the million gods that the Greeks and the Romans, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the world worshipped, and you went, you know, the Jews are onto something, man. That one God thing seems right, you know, and look what God has done with them. And you wanted to change to a monotheistic outlook. There's one God. You had to go to school by the scribes. If you're a male, you had to be circumcised. You had to be accepted into a Jewish community, and you had to begin to practice some of the things that the Jews, by, by law and by faith, practiced themselves. 
But the problem was John was breaking the mold. He was calling on Jews to confess their sins, on Jews to say they needed a Messiah, on Jews to admit that they couldn't be right with God on their own. And even the Jewish converts, the Gentiles, they were baptized in fresh, clean water, not in this muddy, ugly, Jordan, dirty water. So who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? John wasted very little time in answering their challenges to his authority. He said in verse 26, I baptize with water, but there is one who stands among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to loose. John told them I was called by someone else. My authority doesn't come from you. It comes from another, not from you. And the one that's coming after me, and John is really good at turning the attention from himself back to the purpose why he's there. The one who's coming after me, he is standing amongst you. You don't know him. He's preferred. He was first. You got to know him. John the Baptist was baptizing people as an outward sign of repentance so that one day the people could stand before Jesus and receive him. But John's entire ministry was nothing more than simply pointing people to Jesus, preparing them. And so John says, literally, look, who I am is not the issue. And what I'm doing is really not the issue either. He's the issue. He's among you. You don't know him. That's the issue. That's the purpose for which John came. And and John is humble enough to say of himself, look, when it comes to him, I couldn't even begin as a lowly servant to tie his shoes. There's no comparison here. There's that much of a divide between the two of us. Well, John then gives a a footnote, and he said these things, verse 28, were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The word Bethabara means house of the ferry, and it was a traditional site where the the fork, if you will, of the Jordan River turned um, to head down to the Dead Sea. It is, it, it's a place where the Jordan kind of splits. And so today, if you go to Israel with us next time, they have now, Israel is building a baptismal site right at the fork <laughs> of the Jordan River as it heads for the Dead Sea, right where John was baptizing traditionally, and they found artifacts to support that. So we've gone there to look at the place. We kind of like up the river a little better, but in any event... Um, this is the place, and, and as you stand there, if you look 50 yards across the Jordan River is Jordan, and Jordan is also building a baptismal site on the same place for the Jordanians who want to come and see where John the Baptist was baptized. So, uh, interesting place. John just kind of points it out. It was at the fork of the river, so we'd know where it was. Well, then you read the words, and it's important, the next day. So this took place on day one, if you will. The next day, day two, John sees Jesus coming toward him, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me. He was before me. Now John sees Jesus coming, and this is the day he's going to point him out. Day one, he had had the discussion with the Pharisees, men from Jerusalem. Day two, Jesus comes to present himself. Now remember Matthew 3, baptized 40 days in the wilderness, comes back into public eye, if you will, and now he is publicly introduced for the first time. The next day after his confrontation, and John the Baptist points Jesus out in the crowd, and he verifies his deity. In fact, you might want to note that in verse 15, in verse 27, and now again in verse 30, he says the same thing three times. He was before me, he's preferred before me. He he stresses his divinity. Even though John was older and he came first, Jesus is preferred and he was first because he was God. It's not about me. It's all about him. And he uses the word that you should get used to in the New Testament, the word behold, because it doesn't just mean turn around and look. It means stop what you're doing and gaze at this for a minute. Isn't this the weirdest thing you've ever seen? Or check this out, really. It's that kind of a strong word. Look at this. There he is. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Lord's first appearance in John's gospel. He had come to be publicly announced by the one that would be his forerunner, the herald to the nation, now points out the Messiah. There he is. And the time to remove all doubt about what John the Baptist had been saying had come. 
He is the Lamb of God. <laughs> Isn't that interesting that the Jews had been coming for a year repenting of their sins, confessing their failures, but they needed more than that because that's not enough. They needed redemption. Confession, then redemption. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, would come to do what the blood of bulls and lambs could never do. We wanted a substitute. We needed one, the Lamb of God. Now, you might read the Lamb of God and say to yourself, that's not a really impressive title. You know, the, the Jews are looking for the lion of the tribe of Judah. And they get a Lamb of God. No one is frightened by a lamb. It doesn't strike fear into the hearts of those who read it, right? A little lamb doesn't exude fierceness or power. There aren't any beware of the lambs on the, the gate of, of your house, you know, or <laughs> beware of lambs. You don't get that. But, but you should understand that from a Jewish mindset, lambs were only associated with sacrifice. They were raised for that purpose. They were raised for the purpose of being able through sacrificial offerings to draw near to the Lord. And for a son of a priest, who came from a long line of priests to declare to them, this is the Lamb of God, it would drive their minds immediately up to the place of worship, to the temple, and back to the Passover when the Lamb without spot had been killed and his blood was placed on the door, and the people inside and their sin were passed over by the angel of death because of the blood of the sacrifice. That would be a given for them to understand. And John says in verse 31, I wouldn't have known him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from him like a dove. Uh, sorry, descending from heaven like a dove. It remained upon him. I didn't know him. It says that a couple of times, verse 31 and verse 33. But he, said, he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, this is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit, and I want you to know that I've seen it, and I testify to you, this is the Son of God. Now, Jesus and, and John the Baptist were second cousins. And, and G, John the Baptist, even after 30 years, had no real idea that Jesus was the Messiah, which interests me a lot, because I, I, I suspect they had to have some barbecues together, you know? And that someone had to say of Jesus, man, that kid's always doing the right thing, you know? <laughs> How come he's so good, such a goody two-shoes, you know? Why doesn't he ever get in trouble? Whatever the reason was, undoubtedly they had some interaction, but, but notice that if you are going to come to know the Lord, God's going to have to reveal himself to you. You won't figure it out on your own. Ask Peter that at Caesarea Philippi. And, and Peter, who do you say that I am? Oh, you're the son of the living God. You know, you're the Messiah, the promised one. And Jesus immediately said, hey, Peter, I just want you to know you didn't come up with that on your own. God needs to reveal himself to us. And John the Baptist knew that he was called to baptize. He knew he was the forerunner that Isaiah and Malachi had talked about, but he couldn't recognize Jesus except that the Father who sent him said, you'll see him, the Spirit will descend upon him, it will remain with him, you'll know him. And back in Matthew 3, that had happened 42 days earlier, that exactly what had happened to John. And now he sees Jesus coming, and so he's able to identify him. The Holy Spirit stayed upon him. I want to tell you, this is him. Now notice that John the Baptist's testimony is all about Jesus, that, that it all had to do with him. And, and all John cared about is that the people who read these, or I should say the people in the audiences that he spoke to, would know that he was the Lamb of God who had come to take away their sins. He made sure everyone knew he wasn't the light, he was just a light holder, and he didn't let the messenger detract from the message. Behold the Lamb of God. Jesus is more than a nice guy or a great teacher or a prophet of the first order or a miracle worker who can make changes in your life. John nailed it. Behold, look, <laughs> he's the Lamb of God. He's come to take away our sins. Israel wanted a king. God gave them what they needed, a lamb who would be king. So John was an upstart. About 15 years ago, I was asked to do a wedding for a couple from our church who had actually grown up in a denominational church, and so they wanted to go back where their parents had been married, and I was, they asked if I would do their wedding. I said, sure, until the denomination found out I hadn't graduated from a uh, seminary that they would approve of. And so they called me and said, you know, you can't do a wedding at the church. You're not really a pastor. I said, all right, just tell the couple. I don't care. Well, the pastor talked to the couple whose parents were, yeah, they were involved in the church, <laughs> and they had quite a discussion. 
So they decided that I would go before their board and answer Bible questions. And I thought, well, that's cool. I can do that, you know. Ask away, guys. And, and they started asking questions. So I quoted verses like you would be able to. Hey, what's what the Bible says? And, and they expected me to thumb my way across or fumble. I had answers. Here's the Bible says. I brought a Bible with me. Put it down for me. Shoot away. And finally, the guy says, would you excuse us for a minute? I went outside. And I came back in. They said, all right, you, you can do the way. I thought, really? And I thought about John, though, because poor John's in that same kind of condition. You know, he doesn't match up or meet up with the standards, but he's the one the Lord sent. Now, we started off by asking you when we began, what kind of influence are you having in this generation for the gospel as far as bringing unbelievers to the Lord? And how often do you speak with them? So let me give you four things to maybe mark down or think about in light of just the verses we read this morning, as John becomes that voice crying in the wilderness, prepare to meet the Messiah, make straight the way of the Lord. And I would say the first thing you should write down is this, be aware of who you are. John was very aware of who he was. And, and by knowing who you are, it also means knowing what you're not. Here's what you're not. You're not the Messiah. You're not a Savior. You're not Elijah. You're not a prophet. You're simply a voice. And if you'll see that as so, a lot of pressure will be lifted off your shoulders. You don't have to save anybody. You don't got to be the answers. You don't have to have answers for everything. You just got to know the one who does. John was very humble. Man, I just, just go talk to him. Follow him. He said to John and, and the other apostles, Peter, get going, man. Follow him. I don't need you with me. I got to decrease. He's got to increase. Know who you are. It'll take a load off your back. You know, people come to the church and to the pastors with all kinds of problems, and they usually wait till the last minute when things are absolutely falling apart, and they come in, they, they lay it all out for you, and you go, oh, that's horrible, and then they just fix that. <laughs> I can't. But let me tell you who can. And sometimes biblical counseling is easy. If you're doing the wrong thing and the Bible says the right thing, that's easy. But ultimately, it's not your counsel that helps people. It's the Lord's counsel. It's not you that save people. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God save people. So, so know who you are. It'll take a lot of pressure off of you. Be aware of who you are. Send them to Jesus. Secondly, be vocal in your witness. Now, I know that might be a problem for some of you, but you ought to speak up. If you're going to be a witness for Jesus, at some point in your life, you're going to have to open your mouth. Here's what I hear from people all the time. Well, I'm not good at speaking, you know, so I just live my life as a witness. Great, that won't work. Because at some point people are going to go, how come you're like you are? And if you don't say it's because Jesus has taken over my life, they're going to give you credit. You're so nice, you're so kind, you're so long-suffering, you're so wonderful, you're the best. You go, well, thank you, and I'm just being a witness. <laughs> Wrong. You're stealing glory from God. Speak up. Speak up. They need to hear a voice. John said, I am a voice. Jesus came in and he changed my life and I met the Lord and he forgave my sins. Speak up. Silent witnesses are just that. They are silent and oftentimes worthless. And you wonder, how come I haven't shared with anybody? You've been quiet way too long. Well, what are they going to say about me? Who cares? What are you going to say about him? Thirdly, be filled with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. No wonder he was so bold. When the disciples met Jesus on Easter evening, there in Luke uh, chapter 24 and John chapter 20, he breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. He, he sent them forth with a message of the gospel. He opened their eyes that they might understand the scriptures. They were saved, born again. And then he said this, you wait here until you receive promise from on high, the promise of the Spirit, to be filled with power. And then, he, Acts 1.8, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria throughout the uttermost parts of the earth. You need to be filled with the Spirit. If you don't think the first, church, the first century church had more to go on than you do, and yet they needed to be filled with the Spirit, how much more do we need God's power upon our life? John was bold, he wasn't put off by the opinions of the religious leaders who hated his message. He lost no sleep over their words and threats, even Herod. 
because he served Jesus. And I think every one of you needs a personal Pentecost. You need a baptism in the Holy Spirit. And if you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit to be a witness for Jesus, then you should come up and pray with one of the pastors this morning and ask the Lord to fill you. Because we need his boldness. Oh, fear we can come up with all on our own. But to be bold, we need him. We need him. And we'll be happy to pray with you this morning. God will pour out his spirit upon those who will call upon him. Be aware of who you are. Be vocal in your witness. Be filled with the spirit. And finally, make it about Jesus. We love to beat around the bush, don't we? How about just getting to the point? When you get right to, down to it, it's not about you. It's not about your ministry. It's not about your accomplishments. It's not about your ideas. It's about Jesus. Isn't it? The opposition, when you begin to share your faith, will want to make it about anything else. They want to know, hey, John, who are you? And by what authority do you baptize people? Who are you? He turned it all around. He made it about Jesus. He answered quickly and quietly and then moved on to Jesus. I'm a voice. Let's talk about the one who's coming after me. I'm a nobody. He's a somebody. Go to him. You, you'll find that when you start speaking to, to people about Jesus, they'll immediately want to change the subject. How many books in the Bible are there? Why do so many denominations exist? Wanting to run you around. Stick with Jesus. Get you off your message. Stick with Jesus. John did. Watch him. And when you talk to people and they tell you they believe in Jesus, just be sure you know which Jesus they believe in. Because there's a whole bunch of Jesuses in the world that won't save you. You know, straw saviors who have no power. The Jesus of the Bible, you need to know. In fact, by the time we get to the end of chapter 2, the last three verses, we're going to spend a whole week looking at the believers who didn't believe in the gospel. And there's a lot of them. The biblical Jesus is first and foremost a lamb who died on a cross for the sins of the world. So, Know who you are and who you're not. Be a voice, not just a witness in your actions. Be filled with the Spirit and make it all about Jesus. And then you can come back to church and the next time I say, when was the last time you witnessed? You'll have an answer. And a date and a time and a place and a person that you're praying for. You know, we had a baptism yesterday. We had more people baptized than we've seen in 10 years. More people saved than we've seen in 10 years. It was awesome. But I thought, you know, unless we're willing to go out into the world and be a witness, we should have just drowned these people. <laughs> in Jesus' name. <laughs> if you're not going to do anything, just go home. Get out of the way. But we let you all up, so you have a job to do, okay? <laughs> Father, thank you this morning for your word to us. And may we, like John, be... Be a voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the ways of the Lord. And may we, like John, fulfill the ministry that you've given to us. That we may one day be able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord, your Lord, prepared for you before the foundation of the earth. May, may the Lord use you to speak up and shine and and like John, not be moved by the opposition, but be motivated by the love of God and by your knowledge of him. And then many will come. And your life will be a place where fruit is gathered. And people will come to hear and their hearts will be turned to Christ. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you come pray with one of our pastors today. We would love to just ask the Lord to fill you. And he will. Because he's called us to look to his strength, to his power to be witnesses in all of the world. And if you don't know Jesus today, know this. He knows you. And his greatest desire is to give you life. He came so that you might have life much more abundantly. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. That's what he wants. And all you need to do is agree with God about two things. About you, that you're a sinner, and about him, that he's the Savior, he's the Lord. If you can get by those two, Lord, I need help, and you are my help, today you'll be saved. And the work that God begins in you, he will complete in the day that he calls you home.
you need Jesus, you come and you tell one of the guys up front, I, I need the Lord in my life. And let us pray with you. And you can go home with eternal life. And with great joy and with a peace that you won't even believe. You come. Shall we stand?